Hello, I am planning on making Ethiopian food tomorrow Friday night. It is currently Thursday afternoon and I just figured I would take the opportunity to uh, put together a quick video of how I make injera. It's not the only way to make injera, but it's um, something that I've found that works for me. Uh, I've put the instructions out um, there with uh, shared some people and um, have been asked for a video a couple times and just thought this would be a good chance to do it. So uh, enjoy. The first thing we're going to do is uh, just wash our hands because, well, you're going to be really touching the food. So I want to make sure that we get our hands good and clean. And what we're going to do is we're going to take three cups of tough flour. two cups of barley flour and two cups of white flour. Now you can use different flour mixtures for this. This is just what I've found um, has worked the best for me. Um, we've made it with a few different flours. We've made it with wheat flour partially. Um, we've made all taff once uh, and that worked great too, but this is what uh, our family prefers. So I uh, just make the the flour into a uniform mixture so it's all mixed together and it'll be kind of a light brown color there so we have all of our flour as one uniform mixture uh, and then what you're going to do is you're going to take your starter or your uh, leet, I believe it's called an Amharic. And I took this out of the fridge uh, a couple days ago and fed it, and yesterday fed it uh, some tough flour. So it should be good and healthy and happy. Um, this is two cups of starter. Uh, and if you don't have a starter, you can make one by just mixing some flour and water and letting it sit out on the counter for a week or more to ferment. Uh, this particular starter I've been maintaining for a couple of years um, in my house. I had one before this that I let go a little too long and got kind of gross, but uh, this one has been around now for a couple of years and uh, you can just keep it in the fridge, let it um, sit for weeks or even a month or more between feedings. Um, it's, it's fairly easy to maintain. You just, uh, to, by feed it, what I'm referring to there is you're just going to take out uh, the starter, you're going to feed it equal parts water and flour. Um, so if you have two cups of starter, you can either pitch one cup uh, and then feed it a cup of flour and a cup of water, you're going to want to double the size of it. So, Or if you're trying to build it up, you can just feed it two cups. So you're going to mix that in uh, and then you're going to take some warm water and just slowly start to add some water to the mixture. And the idea here is to make uh, to make it a dough ball, like you're making bread. Uh, so you're just going to slowly add water until you have a ball. And this is uh, lukewarm water. It's it's warm to the touch. You know, maybe uh, 105 degrees somewhere around there. It's it's warm, but it's not hot. Uh, at this point, it really doesn't matter too much, but the warmer the water, um, the more likely your yeast is to kind of take off or your starter to kind of take off uh, right away. So what I'm using here uh, to mix this in is a, actually a, a small two gallon fermentation bucket that's used for making beer and wine. Uh, I bought this specifically for this. Um, you can use a regular pitcher, like a, a one gallon or five quart pitcher uh, that you would use to make juice or lemonade or whatever. Um, but I prefer this for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, because it's, it's larger, it's got a larger mouth opening. It's a little easier to, uh, to be able to work in than a, than a regular pitcher. Uh, and it also, if you can see it behind me or not, there's a lid for it uh, that has a hole uh, that I can use a lid and an airlock for, which 
uh, isn't a big deal. You obviously, with fermentation, you don't want to seal a lid on something because it'll probably explode. So with, uh, with a pitcher or something, it can have kind of a loose fit and that's fine, but uh, fruit flies do really like stuff that's fermenting. So um, with the airlock and the lid, it just keeps it nice and secure. I don't have to worry about it really getting knocked over and spilling. Don't have to worry about flies being in it or anything like that. So, um, so you can see here that I'm now to the point where my dough is, uh, is a good, a good firm dough ball. Uh, and what you're going to do is you're going to knead that for a couple minutes, just like you're kneading bread, uh, kneading dough for a loaf of bread. And just get the sourdough starter all worked in to that dough. That'll just take a couple of minutes. Um, like I said, right now it is uh, around lunchtime on Thursday afternoon and we're planning on eating the injera tomorrow night. So. Um, it's a little bit shorter than I would normally try and in general, um, if I'm making injera for Friday night, I will try to start it on Thursday morning, but I just didn't have an opportunity this morning to do that. So we're running a couple hours behind, but I don't think it's going to be a problem because, um, the starter was, was good and active and we fed it for a couple days. So, uh, that's very happy and it will start to ferment pretty quickly. All right, so we're gonna call that good. I'm gonna try to take this out of here. He's part of it. So we have a good firm dough ball. You can see that it's not real stretchy, but um, just a good, a good start for it. So then once you have that done, uh, the idea is to take your water pitcher and just slowly start to add more water to it and start to work it down into a batter. And just kind of put your hand in there and squish it around until all of the, the dough is, um, is, is thinner. And this will take a couple of minutes to get it all going. But as you go, just slowly add a little more water. And you'll notice that I don't give any um, any quantities for water that I add. It's because when you make injera, you make it based on texture uh, and consistency as opposed to specific amounts. So uh, with your sourdough starter, in some cases it's going to be thicker, some cases it's going to be thinner. Your amount of water isn't always going to be the same. So uh, I just keep a pitcher handy and add it as I go. How much it is, I really don't know, but it doesn't really matter. So you can see that we're starting to get a little more runny here. There's quite a few lumps in it yet, so the idea is to pull those out and just kind of try to squeeze those in your hand to get the batter nice and smooth. And that process can take a few minutes. So the, uh, the same goes for the quantities of flour. Uh, the amount that I'm using here, uh, the three cups of taff, two cups of barley, and two cups of white flour, uh, at the start of tomorrow, we're also going to add two cups of self-rising flour. So you'll need to make sure that you have that as well. Uh, and this amount of, of flour ends up making about um, 12 to 13 full-size injeras. And by full-size, I mean 16-inch, um, which is making them on the, uh, the electric grill uh, in Ethiopia. It's called a mitad 
or I think in Oromo it's maybe called a Magogo. But that is um, an essential piece of equipment if you want to be adept at making injera. Um, you can make it in a pan on the stove, but it's just, it's not as easy, it's not the same. Uh, it's harder to control your temperature. Um, the pan is a very specialized thing, it's, it's no stick. Um, it's very consistent with heating and um, wasn't that expensive either. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later once it's time to actually cook this stuff, but um, that is, is very important and, and you'll see uh, how that works in a bit. So we're getting, getting closer yet. Uh, you can see that the batter is starting to get to pretty close to the right consistency, but uh, there's still a few lumps. So I'm gonna add, once again, a little more water. And I won't need a whole lot more yet here, but we're just gonna fill the pitcher up to make sure we have enough. So we're getting pretty smooth here. Uh, at this point, the consistency is not as important uh, as it gets to be at the end when you're actually gonna make the injera because what's gonna happen uh, over the next 24 or 18 hours as this ferments, um, the liquid is gonna come out uh, to the top and the batter will settle to the bottom. So um, what I usually do is uh, when I'm all done, I will pour a little bit of water around the edges, which kind of cleans the edges of the, uh, of the bucket um, and, and gives a little bit of liquid on the top already. And then uh, bubbles will start to come up out of the, the bottom uh, as it ferments. And there will be a small layer of fermenting uh, injera on the top with water between it, maybe an inch. Uh, and then the batter settles to the bottom. So tomorrow morning when we pick this up, uh, then what we're gonna do is just pour that off and uh, we'll take it from there. But, so you can see at this point, uh, I think we're about good. So you can see it's, it's very runny and this is a little more runny than you would, than you would want it um, to make it. But I just added water, so. Uh, I think that's about good. We have all, most at least, of the lumps squished out of it. Got a couple more there yet. So hopefully I don't spill this. You can see it's just a very runny, liquidy mixture at this point. And we're just gonna slowly, I guess rinse off my hand first and then Try to clean off the sides of the bucket here and that will, we'll put the small layer of liquid on the top, which may or may not be, be critical, but um, there's a lot of different advice out there on the internet for injera and some people like to think that way is the only way, but uh, lots of people do it lots of different ways and this is just uh, the way that I have found for me that seems to produce very consistent results. So, so that's done. Uh, we are going to take our lid, press that on there. Fill up our airlock with some water. And this is all stuff that you don't need. You can, like I said, just use a regular uh, a regular pitcher with a lid, something like like this. Um, this is plenty good for a regular size batch of injera. If you start to make a batch that's a little bigger, uh, this can run a little small and then you will need to use two. But um, that, even that still works. And that's what I used to do when I make, make a bigger batch. Um, sizing of this is, Obviously you can scale it to whatever you want. You can make it bigger, you can make it smaller. But uh, this is the size that usually will uh, feed our family with a few guests and give us a couple of injurers left over for the next day. So 
that's about it. We are good to go. Um, so what you're going to want to do now is just take this and place it someplace warm um, to ferment overnight. So we're back on morning number two. Uh, we are having Ethiopian food tonight and we have our uh, bucket of injera here that has been sitting since yesterday afternoon. As you can see here, there's a small ring around the top um, of batter that is much higher than the liquid level and there's quite a bit of liquid and if you look closely you can see that there are lots of um, little bubbles rising to the surface, that's good. Uh, the, the little ring means that the fermentation of the batter is mostly done and the little bubbles mean there's still a little bit going on which is just what we wanna see. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna dump this liquid down the drain and you can see there's quite a bit of it until we get to just the batter. Turn off my water here. In the background I had some hot water going. We'll use that in a little bit. Uh, so what we're left with now is a thicker batter that has very little liquid left in it. So for now we're going to take this and set it off to the side. And we are going to take our two cups of self-rising flour. And you can mix this directly in with the batter, but I find it much quicker and easier to do it separate because it's a real pain to get uh, the lumps out of self-rising flour. So I just quick uh, mix it together with some warm water. I made the mistake of using the hot water for this once and it actually started to cook the flour and that um, ended up having to be thrown away and started over. So. Uh, we're just gonna follow the same process, but a little quicker that we did yesterday and mix it up. Uh, and this flour is real squishy and soft and has a much different texture than uh, the teff and barley flour do. I'm just gonna quick mix it down. And this water is fairly hot. It's not boiling, obviously I can touch it, but uh, it's, it's not just lukewarm, it's, uh, it's fairly warm. So, all right, I think that's about good enough to the point. There's a lot of big lumps there that you can see, but that's not a big deal because the blender will make short work of those. Once again, you can do this without a blender if you so choose, but uh, I just find this easier. small bits at a time. You can pour them right in. And what the self-rising flour does is it, um, it rises by creating CO2 inside of the batter. Um, kind of just like fermentation, only it does it without fermentation. You probably wouldn't, wouldn't need to do this, but you're just gonna uh, probably get a little more of the eyes. Get it for more eyes in the batter. So we have our batter now, and we're gonna to start to mix this in. And you're gonna see that this is really thick and definitely needs a lot more liquid. We're gonna mix it together until it's uniform. A tea kettle here of hot water that I put on the stove uh, a little while ago before I started, uh, got it to about the point of boiling and then turned it off. And you don't want to add actual boiling water here, but um, so we're just going to add some, some water in here. And I've been doing this already, so you're not going to see me add 
uh, add a lot here. But you just want to keep slowly adding the water in until we get it to the right uh, to the right consistency here, which uh, I think we are looking pretty good. As you can see here, the the batter is is nice and runny. At this point, you can uh, you can be a little more runny than you need if um, if it works out. That's not that big of a deal because you will have the opportunity to pour off a little more liquid at the end. So you can see that this is uh, it's a little bit more runny than a pancake batter, but uh, maybe a little less than a crepe batter, and it should feel nice and smooth. There won't be a lot of grit or uh, clumps at all in it. So now that our batter is mixed in, we're just going to take our cover, cover it back up. And one more time, we're going to set this someplace warm for um, probably about four hours or so. Uh, what I will usually do is uh, do this step in the morning and then at lunchtime, uh, what you will do is take it and place it someplace uh, cool. So we take it from someplace warm, I let it ferment a little bit more. The uh, self-rising flour will, uh, will start to ferment and you'll see the level in the bucket start to come up. Um, and then after about four hours or so, you're gonna set it either in the refrigerator or if it's winter, you can set it out in the garage or uh, someplace cool. And what that will do is it will drive the CO2 uh, that's in the mixture from fermenting from self-rising flour uh, that will drive that down into the batter uh, and that will make more eyes when you cook your injera. So uh, that is it and we'll be back to cook this. So we are back and we are ready to make our injera. So as you can see here we have uh, the batter has separated out a little bit more. There's a little more water there. So uh, we're just going to take that and I don't think I'm going to have to dump any off, but I'm going to dump just a little bit of water off here. Um, in case it's runny, you can always add it back. And we're just going to take our spoon and uh, mix it in because things have kind of settled out over the last eight hours. So I did go through, uh, left it for four hours or so. Um, in a warm place and then moved it to a cold place for four hours and now the batter is nice and cold. You'll be able to see here that uh, the batter is good and runny. Uh, there should be little bubbles forming on the top which is good. It just means that there's CO2 in there that's going to be making eyes for us. So what I will do at this point is I'm going to take my batter and I'm just going to dump that into a pitcher so it's easier to pour. That'll give you an idea of the consistency here. So what we have here is a mitad in Amharic. It's the grill that is used uh, to cook injera. Uh, this is a Bethany Housewares um, heritage grill that is made from making lefsi. Uh, and I will generally set it to around 450 degrees when I make it. Your temperature may or may not vary. Some people have it a little lower. Most people have it right at 500, but uh, I find that it's easier to burn the bottom when it's at 500. And there's a couple different ways you can do it, um, and I'm going to show you both. In Ethiopia, traditionally, they will pour the batter out in a circle from the outside edge toward the middle. Uh, you can also pour it in a corner. I'm going to take one cup of batter, and I use this uh, little measuring cup just because it's easy to pour and it's easy to measure. And then you're just going to start at the outside corner 
and pour it in a circle. This is much harder than it looks. It took me a long time to get this down. And then you will just pick it up a little bit and kind of smooth around the edges. In Ethiopia, they don't do it this way, but I am not in Ethiopia, so. We will set it down and we will wait until the eyes fill about um, a third or two thirds of the injera. You can see there are eyes starting to pop there. And then we're going to cover it up. And the idea is to make sure that um, it starts to steam out of the vent on the side. Uh, and that's when you know that it's cooked and you can take it off. When it comes time to take it off, the best tool for the job is this, which is called a sefed in Ethiopia. Uh, they are hard to come by in the U.S. I actually got that one in Ethiopia. Uh, but you can always use something else, like maybe even cardboard or something like this wicker placemat to pull them off if uh, you're unable to find one. So you see we've got some good steam there. And you'll see that the edges start to peel up. And that's when you know that they're, they're done. I usually try to fan it. That lifts the edges a little more. And you can stick the sifid underneath and just pull it right off. Another way that you can pour it is just in one corner. So we're going to take our cup of batter, sprinkle a little salt. The salt may or may not be necessary, but I like it. Uh, and just take your batter, pour it in one corner, and then slowly stretch it out. And this is much easier, but you do not get quite as good of eyes forming in the injera. So you can see right here along the edge where I poured the initial batter, there's going to be lots of eyes. And then outside of that, it's not going to be as good. One thing with injera is you do not want to stack warm injera on each other or they will stick. So you want to wait till they dry off. I will generally take them and set them out on the table until they cool. If you can see right there, you have your initial circle mark and, and good eyes here, and this is a little more flat. It still tastes fine and it's fine, but it's just not quite as good. You can see the bottom there. It's nice and soft, no burn marks. Take our cup of batter.
We're starting to get some steam there. Pull it off. Very nice looking injera. The edges are starting to peel here. So we are all set. We have a nice stack of 13. Nice soft spongy injeras with uh, no burns on the bottom, really nice. Stack nice. With the reason that we do it, and the most important reason is they taste nice. I hope that this video can be helpful to uh, some of you who are out there trying to make injera. I know for me that it took me a long time to get to the point where I was comfortable and where I feel like uh, I had it down and I just thought it might be helpful for those who are going through that same thing right now to uh, have a video to watch to be able to pick it up. So enjoy, feel free to let me know what you think.